and, and visually impaired persons. Okay, thanks a lot. How's the sound? Is that good? Uh, it's, <coughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. I um, <coughs> met Daniela um, many years ago, and it's really nice to, um, to get to see her again. I was curious about bids, and this is my, my first uh, trip here. Thanks a lot. So this talk today is going to be also less about data science, <coughs> less about machine learning, and more about sort of domain-specific knowledge. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to start with the, the motivation. Um, coming from smith Cutterwell, which is all about vision and vision disorders and rehabilitation, uh, vision impairment is obviously something that's on the rise. Um, it's associated with the aging population. And a whole bunch of the common diseases that, that uh, remove vision or degrade vision diabetic retinopathy, um, macular degeneration, cataract, glaucoma, everything, the incidence goes up pretty quickly with age. And the standard statistic, um, you know, is that around 10 million Americans have some sort of vision impairment. Um, 1.3 million are blind. So it's a, it's a large and growing problem. And um, <clears throat> it's important to sort of have an overview of what sorts of existing tools and techniques are there to cope with this problem. Well, there are a lot of tools um, out there, and um, most of them are completely obvious to you. I just want to list them anyway. Um, I, I tend to separate the population into two sort of compact uh, groups, blind and low vision. There isn't necessarily a, a firm dividing line between those two. Um, but um, essentially, people who in this talk will refer to as blind tend to rely heavily on a white cane or a guide dog um, to get around. Um, Typically, they'll use maybe um, braille media, um, screen readers, tactile graphics, things that um, allow them to get information tactilely or, or haptically. Um, and of course, the more modern stuff, and I'll talk a bit about this as well, um, OCR apps are becoming very powerful, um, apps that do object recognition on your smartphone. And so a lot of people who, are, who would fall into the, the blind category I'd say are people who prefer, again, information to be conveyed in a tactile or audio form. Um, on the other hand, if you're in the low vision group, typically you want to maximize the use of your remaining vision, so you'll use magnifiers, telescopes. Um, and you know, just several years ago, I met a, a low vision student from Berkeley who told me something that in hindsight was completely obvious, and yet it had never occurred to me. You know, if he's standing at a food court in the mall or something, he's trying to read the menu, he'll just take a picture with his smartphone and then zoom up at his leisure. You don't have to you know, worry about um, maintaining your, your posture with a telescope and so forth. Um, so those are some of the very basic tools. Um, obviously, there are a huge number of gaps to fill, things that, you know, problems that arise you know, on a daily basis that aren't well addressed by you know, current tools. Um, and one category I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about um, falls under navigation and wayfinding. And, um, and you know, there are lots of apps out there to help you to, to get from point A to point B. But at the moment, there are really not a lot of things that can help you with some specifics like um, how, how would I walk to transfer from one bus to another? Um, you can imagine the GPS tells you you're, you're at the right intersection, but it doesn't have the, the spatial resolution to tell you much more than that. Or you're in an indoor domain. Um, I'm in this huge building. How do I get to a specific doctor's office? Um, or I'm outdoors. I've been walking around a lot. I'm tired. I want to sit down. Is there a place to sit down, like a bench or something? You're not going to find that necessarily on your, your Google Maps. Um, another sort of category of, of um, you know, obstacles would be access to all sorts of media. These could include um, physical documents, books or magazines. They could include devices and physical objects as well. Um, and again, th there's a huge range. Um, if you want to see a movie with friends, well, OK, you can't see it necessarily if you have very poor vision. But is there some way you can understand the gist of it? VoiceOver, for instance. Um, <clears throat> perhaps there's a relief map that you want to explore in your history class, but you can't really see the labels on it. Um, or a, a 3D biological model if you're learning about in, in class, the structure of the cell, for instance. Um, or more uh, prosaic things that, you know, at home, the microwave, in, microwave oven may have a touch panel which is, has no tactile features whatsoever. So how do you know where you're touching? And um, again, you know, OCR is wonderful, but if you have a document, uh, a physical document that has a very complex layout, it's often hard to navigate around that document. And, you know, 
you, you may find that the OCR is reading aloud and jumps from one line to another that's logically completely you know, dissociated in, in time. Um, so I, I'm a computer vision guy by, by background. Um, how can computer vision help fill some of these gaps? And um, you know, just to remind you know, people here, some of the main strengths and weaknesses of computer vision. Um, so over the years, um, especially with the advent of deep learning or other machine learning algorithms, object recognition has gotten very powerful. Um, very specifically, optical character recognition, OCR, is getting better and better. It used to be in the old days that you had to use a flatbed scanner and scan a physical document with high resolution, very high quality to get good results. But now, you know, Google does OCR on street signs all the time. Um, and 3D geometry, reconstructing the three-dimensional world around you, um, that, that's getting really good. Um, in the past, it was maybe only with you know, stereo rigs or, or depth sensors, and now you can do a lot of stuff um, you know, monocularly. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, I always have to keep in mind some of the weaknesses and limitations of computer vision. Um, and one of the, the big categories of weaknesses really has to do with the camera that you have. Um, and typically, if I'm thinking about an application for um, someone who's got a vision impairment, typically the camera of choice is the smartphone camera, which is pretty good, but um, there are issues like the limited field of view, um, the dynamic range uh, can be a problem, and susceptibility to motion blur that, that can pose really big challenges. Um, and of course, as anyone knows who's worked in, in computer vision, uh, algorithms are getting better and better, but they still tend to be brittle. Sometimes they make sort of outrageous mistakes, um, and they still don't have the common sense that maybe a, a toddler has. So um, they're limited in, in their generality and sort of depth of what they can perceive and understand. Um, but just some quick examples, if, if people are curious about this field, um, you know, uh, there's an app called Seeing AI from Microsoft, and you can download it uh, for free. And it has a lot of features built in, um, text recognition, and again, not just OCR, and there are many, many apps that will do that for you, not just OCR for documents, but also sort of short form text. Um, you're near a sign, for instance, and you want to get that read aloud. Um, product recognition. Um, recognizing people's faces um, and money, and some, some scene recognition, which is, which is pretty good as well. Um, and Microsoft is putting a huge effort into this kind of activity, and uh, the user interface is, is very accessible. It's very well thought through. Um, <coughs> so for the low vision application, um, a commercial system that's, that's quite popular is called OrCam, and this is a wearable camera system. You see the glasses with the little camera. Um, there's a, a little cable to a small box, not, not too big, much bigger than this, um, you know, this microphone transmitter. And the main two functions, um, well, the way it works, first of all, is, is typically it's a person who has some residual vision, and you point at some sort of target of interest, the camera recognizes where your finger is, and something is done where you're pointing. So reading aloud the text, um, the sentence that you're they're pointing to, for instance, and also face recognition is another um, sort of the main function. Apparently, um, they were going to do something with uh, traffic intersections, guidance at traffic intersections, but I believe the lawyers told them that that's much too dangerous to put into the product. Um, so that will have to wait to the future. Um, so technology trends, um, you know, we wouldn't be here today if we didn't think that the trends are extremely favorable. Um, algorithms, uh, hardware, software, um, sensors, everything is getting better and better over time. And I have no doubt that computer vision and AI will, will basically solve everything. <laughs> Um, eventually. But I don't just want to go home and retire and wait for that to happen. Um, in the meantime, there are a lot of gaps that, that can be filled. And whatever sort of limitations there are of, of AI, you can always think about augmenting AI, or in some cases, replacing the AI with some sort of humans in the loop um, process. And just broadly, two categories of that would be crowdsourcing. And typically, that's the kind of thing where you have an image, and you upload it somewhere, and some crowd worker annotates it. Um, and gets back to you, you know, on the order of a half a minute or something like that. So it's low, it tends to be low cost, fairly high latency. Um, if you need something more immediate, there's the live video chat. And um, there are two apps out there. One is Be My Eyes. And I'd encourage people to try this. This is an app that basically hooks up volunteer sighted assistants with people who are blind. And I'm a volunteer. And you know, once every few months, I get a little message. You know, Can you help me read something? Um, and the idea is that you know you have a live interaction. The the sighted assistant sees the camera from 
from the user's perspective, and they have an audio conversation. Um, and one, one theme that will emerge sort of in this talk is that very often the, the substance of a lot of sort of um, conversations that you have to have with a, with a person who can't see well is how to aim the camera. It's a non-trivial problem unless you can see the viewfinder. Um, and <coughs> just to, to talk about some of the issues, of, if you're comparing computer vision or AI with humans in the loop, you know, machines versus people, there are a lot of different issues. Some of them are purely technical, like latency. You know, I tend to favor computer vision as a solution when you need something very fast. Um, um, reliability and scope of generality, obviously that's, that's something where you know, if, if you want to get a very definitive answer, you want to check the image with a human, perhaps. Um, or if you want to ask an incredibly general sort of set of questions, perhaps the human is, is best you know, able to, to answer those. Um, another thing that comes up that's very interesting is the effect that the technology or, or, or non-technology choice has um, on sort of the feelings of independence or interdependence. And I've spoken with a number of blind or visually impaired participants who point out that some days or some circumstances, they really want to be independent. They, they want to do something on their own and they want the technology to do that for them. They don't want to have to ask for help. Um, other days, or other people, other conditions, whatever, they actually appreciate the, the social interaction. Um, I spoke with one gentleman who was blind, who really enjoyed using Be My Eyes. He said, you know, I feel like I can ask people questions. I don't have to burden my, my family. You know, they're the usual caretakers. And I get to socialize with, with fun, random, professional strangers, you know. So it, it depends very much, and it's, it's, it's dangerous to assume that uh, a person with a vision impairment may always want one or the other choice. Um, and another thing that comes up is privacy. If, you know, if I'm visually impaired and I'm holding a smartphone around, you know, what if I just got out of the shower, you know, the proverbial bath towel, and inadvertently I pointed the phone at the, um, at the mirror, and suddenly, you know, so, I mean, or, or, you know, maybe the credit card sitting on my desk or something. So, so what sorts of details could be released to a human being or, or maybe put in a database? That causes a lot of concerns, and that's, that's variable, but it's something to keep in mind. <coughs> so the, the focus that, that I have as a researcher um, is I, I try to find well-defined problems that people have with vision impairments. Um, and these are problems that I think can be addressed at least partly by computer vision, sensors, perhaps humans in the loop as well. And it's really important to not just sit around and theorize, um, but to engage end users in all phases of your research. So you want to make sure you're, you're solving a real problem. It's, it's very tempting to say, oh, I have this amazing tool. I just want to use it, um, only to find out that if you actually talk to a blind person that the problem you're proposing Maybe it's not a problem, or there are already really good solutions, so what are you really adding? Um, and of course, your solutions have to be acceptable. They have to be considered usable. They have to be effective. Um, things like cosmetics can enter in, into it. In the old days of computer vision, you might have to wear a huge helmet with you know, a stereo rig. That, that's just a non-starter for anything but research. Um, so that, that fits into the usability um, sort of consideration. Okay. So two of my projects, I, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the first one, and depending on time, I can, I can either go into a little bit of detail or, or more on the second one. Um, the two projects are uh, a smartphone app for indoor wayfinding, and the second one is um, providing audio haptic interaction um, with 2D and 3D objects. So the indoor wayfinding first, so what, what is the need? Um, there are not a huge amount of travel aids that help you with indoor travel. Um, of course, GPS is wonderful. It's not very helpful unless you're outdoors. Um, and maps are great, but in general, you know, even if you can see a map, it's, it's often hard to know where am I right now on the map. And of course, printed signs are just a staple that, that um, you know, most sighted travelers rely on to get around, um, but they're typically inaccessible to, to blind travelers. Um, and then just another little small point, I mean, you may think about using the compass to get around, and we've all done that. Um, it, it tends to be anything sort of magnetic um, sensor based tends to be unreliable, especially indoors. Um, so that's not always a good, good sort of cue. So what kinds of technologies are there to localize, you know, estimate your location relative to some map? or to perform dead reckoning, which is dead reckoning is just a term for you know, estimating your, 
your relative movements. Um, I've gone, I don't know where I started, but I moved you know, perhaps north 10 meters and then east 5 meters. What, what's out there? Um, <clears throat> in the old days, um, at places like Smith Kettlewell and others, people pioneered these remote audible infrared signage. Um, these I basically infrared beacons that encoded um, helpful um, information about your location. They were directionally um, tuned, so you know if you're at an intersection and they had these beacons at different corners, um, the beacons would tell you the appropriate information depending on what you're facing. Um, one thing that's become very popular, there's a, there's a picture right there, um, Bluetooth beacons, and these, these are small battery-powered devices that are small, they just you know, attach them to the wall. The battery tends to, to last uh, you know, somewhere around a year, and um, you know, your, your smartphone can, can find out that it's present and can figure out the ID number of that Bluetooth beacon, and just based on proximity alone can figure out roughly where you are if you can actually f sense multiple beacons in your midst, then there may be some sort of signal strength c calculation you can do to estimate, it, to do some, some sort of basic triangulation to know a little more precisely where you are. Something which I think is becoming very, um, you know, very popular is Wi-Fi positioning. And um, in fact, many airports, I was just in San Diego a few months ago, and you know, Apple Maps has now deployed Wi-Fi based um, positioning in a number of airports, and it's just growing. And you know, I tried it out on my iPhone, and it wasn't flawless, but it, it seemed to work pretty well. I felt like somewhere around you know, five to 10 meters accuracy was, was typical. Um, and I expect that will grow. I don't know, you know I, I expect that this kind of Wi-Fi based solution will permeate lots of public buildings, lots of things like hospitals and airports. Would it make it to this building? I, I don't know. And that's kind of an open question for me. Um, another technology, the inertial measurement unit that's on every modern smartphone, you can use that to do things like count steps when you're walking. Um, you can estimate your, you can estimate very crudely by compass your, your sort of heading, but um, much more precisely you can estimate changes in heading. Um, so that's, that's very useful. And then of course computer vision, which is sort of my, you know, um, my thing. Um, I'll talk today a little bit about visual odometry. Um, which can be thought of as sort of the, maybe a simpler version, a simplified version of, of full SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, and those are, you know, very geometrically focused. Um, and of course, even if you don't have a lot of geometry, you can use computer vision to just recognize, oh, I recognize this scene. We are in this, this part of the building, because I know where I, uh, I've seen this before. Okay, so the, the, the proposed approach I want to talk about today um, so we're developing a smartphone navigation app, and it tracks the user's location, and it will provide turn-by-turn -turn directions to some destination that you want to go to. And the key ingredients that we're using, first of all, is a 2D floor plan. And this has been annotated. Um, it has locations of interest, um, corridors and paths where you can walk, walls and other barriers where you cannot walk and also the locations of signs, such as exit signs and um, room number signs, that kind of thing. And so we have the, the floor plan, it's annotated. Um, we do sign recognition, and you know, if a sign happens to be unique and you, you recognize it, you can say roughly where you are, and if you can estimate the pose of the sign relative to the camera, you can get even more precisely where you are relative to this floor plan. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, often we're talking about users who are blind and perhaps are holding the phone, perhaps they're sort of wearing it. Um, you wouldn't assume that, that the person is able to point um, specifically at signs in the environment. And so it's hard, to, you know, m much of the time there will be no sign that's visible to the camera. And so some sort of computer vision based dead reckoning, I'll talk about that. Um, and there's a project web page and, you know, this, if, in case anyone wants the slides, I'm happy to, to send you a copy. Okay, so the advantages of this approach, um, first and foremost, compared with things like Bluetooth beacons, um, we don't need any new physical infrastructure. So that's great. Bluetooth beacons, you not only have to put up and configure, but typically in a building you'll have, you know, I don't know, dozen or, or dozens perhaps per floor. And then in some stochastic process, each battery dies, you know, and so at any moment in time, you don't really know which ones are working and which aren't. So there's a maintenance cost. And so just using visual signs that are already there um, that's, I think, a big point, big sort of selling point. 
we're trying to make a, a lightweight approach. Um, you know, there, certainly you can do SLAM and you can make these beautiful um, point clouds, 3D point clouds of the building structure. Um, I think that's probably overkill for a lot of applications. Um, and in some cases, you might learn some things that are, that are superficial and perhaps very changeable. Like, you know, maybe a SLAM system would, would think that this little whiteboard here is just permanently, you know, placed right there when in fact maybe every day it moves around. Um, so another, the, the, another sort of important advantage I just kind of alluded to, um, you know, we're asking the user to, to either hold the camera or, or somehow wear it, um, but we're not asking them to specifically aim at, at, cam at, at signs. And again, that's, that's a very difficult thing to ask someone to do if they can't see the viewfinder. Um, another nice thing of, of this lightweight approach, another nice feature is that, you know, typically an entire building model is fairly compact. Um, and you could download it, fit it into your smartphone RAM. And once you've done that, you don't need any connectivity. Um, and there's no reliance on step counting in this approach. Um, and so this should work for wheelchair users, although I haven't actually tested that. Um, so the, the first concept is very simple. Signs act like directional beacons. And this is a little schematic with a floor plan with one, one exit sign at the top. And there are images I took from three different vantage points. And you know, just, just knowing uh, the, you know, the bounding box, basically, of the exit sign, you can estimate the pose. And so, for instance, here, this exit sign looks pretty big in the image. Therefore, you're pretty close. The red spot is sort of the estimated location. So you have these estimates of where you are. And they're directional. Typically, if, you're, if the exit sign is here, at some point, the viewing perspective is so oblique, I can't see it. Or perhaps I'm behind it, and I can't see it. Um, another point to make is that the floor plan shows you walls, and you know it's very easy to model the visibility of the exit sign. You're not going to see the exit sign, you know, over here because it's blocked by walls, and so that's that's a very simple constraint that that bears on the problem. So a past prototype we did back in 2016 um, <coughs> with my my postdoc at the time. Um, we did a dead reckoning approach using the IMU to do step counting and also to track your, your heading. Um, and we had an exit sign detector um, using an a, a, a Adaboost-based uh, cascade, which actually worked very quickly. It was, I forget if it was like 10 frames per second or something on an Android phone. I can't quite remember. But it was fast, fairly reliable. By the way, at the same time, we also uh, had a, a restroom icon detector. But Something about restroom icons, I think people like to cite them in a more discreet manner. You know, exit signs. So I should say that exit signs uh, are mandated by law to be highly visible. The idea is that if you're in any, you know, sort of public corridor, you're supposed to see one somewhere. And, um, but restroom signs are a little more um, mysterious, hard to find. Um, so anyway, we, we had some, some, some good results with that. And um, we tested it with, uh, you know, a few blind users. Um, then we had one user come in, and he, worked, he walked with a very irregular gait. And the, the problem that, that he mentioned was um, that he didn't have a lot of orientation and mobility training yet, because he was sort of newly blind. Um, and so he would kind of shuffle around. He would make a lot of lateral moves side to side, and, and um, anything but a, a regular gait. And it made sense. He was in an unfamiliar environment. He wasn't without excellent O&M skills. He wasn't going to go charging ahead. Um, so, you know, we, we thought about this and we realized, well, an irregular gait is actually fairly common if you happen to be blind and you're exploring an unfamiliar environment. So we thought, hmm, maybe step detection is not a, a good bet. And then shortly after my postdoc left to go to an AR startup, an augmented reality startup, you know, I, I, I got thinking more about AR. And of course, um, this is like last summer, Apple announced the introduction of AR kit. And shortly thereafter, Android, you know, followed suit with something similar. Um, but anyway, there, there's this very nice uh, thing that, that is freely available on iOS and Android, um, VIO, Visual Inertial Odometry. And it combines VO, which is visual odometry, and that's you know, inferring camera movement from parallax, you know, apparent motion of points in the scene, you, and also using the IMU. So the VIO is just the combination of visual odometry, essentially, with the IMU. And VIO estimates pose um, in six degrees of freedom, which is really wonderful. And so you have the, the rotational components, roll, yaw, pitch. Um, and thanks to gravity, um, roll and pitch are anchored um, relative to gravity. 
yaw is relative. And again, there's this age-old problem that you know, you're not going to really trust a magnetometer to tell you which way is north. Um, but once you've established a yaw, the, the, um, the, the, the changes in yaw over time, there's very little drift. It's quite accurate. And of course, a, a 3D translational component as well. And you know that one axis is aligned to gravity. So it's a really nice marriage between two different um, sorts of um, you know, sensors, computer vision and inertial sensing, because um, they have complementary strengths. Visual geometry is great when the features are close to the camera. IMU is really bad at estimating translations. I mean, there are apps that will say, move your camera, move your, your phone you know, a few feet across the door jam, and we'll use the IMU to estimate it. It's, it. it's quite difficult to do that double integration and get anything reasonable. But it is good at estimating rotations. And so even if you have no features visible at all, the rotations, it, it will nail those very nicely. Um, and then, of course, the other point is, you know, I have, I'm using an iPhone 8. It happens to be monocular. Um, with monocular um, cameras, you have a fundamental scale ambiguity. Am I a, a normal person in, a, in a, a small place, or am I, you know, a, a, like a, a tiny uh, creature in a dollhouse moving much more slowly? So anyway, it's wonderful. And um, we, based on this via, we made a new prototype. And let's see, so I have three minutes. Is that right? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> going on a little bit. Um, just let me let me, you know, sail through these slides a little bit more quickly. Um, we're logging right now. We don't have an app that's standalone. We're logging data and analyzing it offline at the moment. Um, but it is important to give audio feedback so that the blind user knows how to aim the camera. You don't want a person to inadvertently point down um, and not see signs of interest. Right now, we're not using our code for finding um, exit signs. We're using these, these nice RUCO markers. Um, and I won't go into, into technical details. We did some experiments with, with uh, users, and we either had them hold the camera by hand, or we had them mount the smartphone. It's hard to see with this lighting condition in this, this photo, but basically on the strap of a satchel shoulder bag. And you know, just to show you the kinds of results you get, you lead them along a path. And when I say lead, this was I was simulating the turn-by-turn -turn directions that, that the system would eventually give in a few years. And they were just logging data, and afterwards we were reconstructing their trajectories. And you know, uh, basically getting getting some reasonable results. The the sort of figure of merit. Um, there were three subjects that we we tested. One of them walked really quickly, and as a result, the camera captured almost no signs and got lost. But generally speaking, the kind of localization error was you know like the median was probably around a meter or two or three. So it, not too bad. That's the take home from that. And um, you know, here I am today. I mean, we're going to be doing deep learning to, to make uh, sign recognition. I'm going to have to think a lot about practical issues like speed, extreme viewpoints, um, motion blur, all these problems. And so if anyone has any advice, I'd, I'd love to, to hear about that. Um, and you know, I'm also I'm certainly aware that that there are deep learning, you know, sort of end-to-end -end techniques that take an image and, and tell you exactly where you are, like like PoseNet. And I'd, I'd like to sort of be aware of how those things are evolving, um, those approaches. And also, right now, we're relying on on sort of a rigorous floor plan, which often is available and often is not. But is there some way we could use something like a rough floor plan that you sketch by hand? Maybe it's non-metric or, or topological or approximate. So um, I think I'll leave it there. I didn't want to exceed my time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, I just wanted to mention, uh, by way of advertising, that we have postdoctoral fellowships, Smith Kettlewell. I think the next opening is in December. Um, and then I have, on this grant that I have to support the indoor na uh, navigation project, um, there's a supplement that I can apply for if there's someone, anyone from high school to, to faculty who's interested in working on this, someone from an underrepresented group, typically someone with a disability or a minority. Um, so if anyone knows anything or, or has any leads, please, please contact me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, that and then I'll get to, to the other person with the microphone. I think um, one of the big issues here is going to be who wants these, these maps to become available to the, let's say, to the public and who does not. 
hypothetically, I posed this question to the controlling officer of, of Smith Kettlewell. I said, what, what would you think if I made our floor plans, like four floors, available to the public? She said, no way. And so I'm going to have to think about the realm of buildings, like maybe this, this, this kind of building. I mean, Berkeley, I'm sure, would be no problem at all. But you know, um, who gets access to these floor plans? Is it in a raw form, or is it only for someone with a visual impairment? You know? And what sort of sharing goes on? The, the thing I like about limiting the imaging to signs is that it kind of handles some of these privacy issues. So by showing this, the sign and cropping it out and putting it in database, we don't have to then show the lavish jacuzzi that, that Berkeley should not have paid for or something, you know, that maybe the SLAM system would, would find. <laughs> and there was one more question. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering, have these uh, kind of more classical computer vision and packet recognition approaches like optical flow or things like this, have these all been tried before and kind of, I mean, I, I imagine you could probably get something like that to run probably pretty quickly on device um, or, or maybe an accelerometer or maybe a combination of all three like augmented reality with accelerometer with some kind of, you know, more classical computer vision. Has that been attempted or is it still kind of Sure, I mean, if you look at VIO, you know, visual inertial odometry, I mean, there, there are papers coming from labs, you know, I don't, I don't remember when the first one was that I saw, maybe 10 years ago or something. And they're kind of putting everything together themselves. And then at some point last summer, VIO became available on, on iOS. So it's, I mean, because of the, the fact that I'm orienting this research so much towards, towards users who are blind and using uh, visually impaired, they really just want to use their smartphones. So on the other hand, I would love to have a lapel um, camera that's totally unobtrusive that does VIO. Um, and yes, in principle, we could certainly do that with our own accelerometers and, and all that. Part of the fun is that the VIO works very well. There, it, it, it's proprietary. I don't know what the performance specifications are, but you know, I have to experiment with it myself. Yes. So are you talking about the, the growth of the visually impaired population specifically? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting because I, I think that even, so I began doing this kind of research, you know, I mean, about 15 years ago, and it was definitely um, just a, a sort of a nerdy researcher kind of, kind of thing to do to try to apply computer vision. Um, and nowadays you have Microsoft releasing this, this app, and the big companies are taking accessibility very seriously and really trying to bake it in. And I think that Five years ago, it was probably some, somewhat of a calculated business decision. Well, we can try to add accessibility. What will that do to our bottom line? Uh, this is just speculation on my part. But now I think there's more recognition that accessibility is it's just one of those basic human rights. And as a blind colleague of mine put it, he said, I don't worry that much, James, if your computer vision algorithm makes mistakes. I just want access to the same visual information that most people have. And so I think that expectation is rising. And if you go to disability conferences, there's a lot of work now in people scrambling, uh, institutions scrambling to make accessible websites and the sort of the, the, the specter of, oh, will there be a lawsuit if it's not, if it's not accessible? So, so I mean, I, I just, I feel like it's, there's a phase transition where now there's a, def a default expectation. Why isn't this accessible? Why shouldn't it be accessible? Whereas five or 10 years ago, that yeah, was nice to have. So I don't know how that's actually, you know, factoring into companies' decisions on the kind of technology they release. But the other thing is that even though I'm very focused on vision impairment, I'm always thinking about applications that are useful for everyone. And you know, a wheelchair user, uh, well, OK, how about, I mean, I get lost really easily. I would love to have indoor navigation when I go to an airport, for instance. Thank you.